but yeah, thanks. Thanks all for coming. Um, as Amy mentioned earlier, we're recording and uh, it will also be available on our Flywire YouTube channel after the event. Um, our last town hall was in April, so it's been a little while. And the goal of today is to provide a progress report. So to tell you where we're at, this is a large consortium effort. So um, uh, there are many people involved, um, and uh, but we wanted to share with the, with the whole community um, the larger community, even those uh, who may not be members of Flywire, where we're at. Um, we've hit a, a major milestone, as you'll hear. We finished uh, proofreading of the central brain, and we're nearing completion of the whole brain. And so we'll talk about that today. And the other goal for today is that we wanted to collect feedback. So we want to hear from you all uh, with questions, um, but also uh, you know feedback on the resource uh, and ways we can make it better. So. With that, um, I'm going to pass it over to Sven Dorkenwald, who um, uh, is going to tell you about uh, primarily our proofreading efforts. Thank you, Mana. Let me grab the screen share from you. And yes. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I will give an update on the proofreading progress. And I want to start by going back in time. Uh, to 2019, and we started proofreading Flywire. Here, every dot is an edit in Flywire. It was first on the Aspen Princeton, then more, more of the community members joined. And we have seen a drastic rise in the number of edits. And today, we have done over 2 million edits together in Flywire over the last three years. Uh, that's a truly staggering number. And those contributions have come from many, mem many members, over 200 people have contributed at least 100 edits, 138 over 1,000 edits, and contributions came from everywhere in the community. Today still, there are 60 people every week that are making at least one edit, so that's what I'm counting weekly unique users in this plot here. And this upper plot here is showing the edit, the edits over time. Right now, we are seeing three to four edits every minute on average. In this plot, I want to point out two things. First, Last week, um, right before our town hall, um, we decided and announced to supplement community proofreading with targeted proofreading. So the Sun, Murphy, and Shepherd's Lab have um, targeted regions that were not um, proofed by the community. And folks in Princeton, at Cambridge, and also externally at our Yatney and 611 have done a tremendous amount of work to create this data set. Another thing I want to point out is um, that the, the IY players that joined Flywire early this year, they call them the Flyers. You will hear more about this group um, from Amy Sterling, um, two talks ahead. And those folks have done a lot of work, especially in the optic lobes, um, proofreading, proofreading those. So all this proofreading effort um, has led to the completion of the central brain. There are about 47,000 neurons in the central brain that have more than 100 synapses in the central brain. That's how I'm counting them here. And when I say proofread, I mean they have been marked as proofread. So this is basically what you can see in Flywire as the green light bulb. Um, orange means nobody has marked it as proofread. Green means somebody has marked it as proofread. And here I'm putting them as num over number of synapses. And when I say synapse, I want to be very clear. I mean a synaptic link between a pre and a post partner. A presynaptic button can therefore have multiple synapses in how I count them here. So I've completed the central brain. Um, proofreading continues, of course, in the optic lobes. There we have, at this moment in time, about 60,000 neurons proofread that have more than 100 synapses in the optic lobe. In total, um, that makes up for 99.4 thousand neurons as of Tuesday. So as of today, we have actually crossed 100,000 neurons proofread, which is a huge milestone in itself. Um, and we, we continue proofreading, of course, and the goal is to proofread everything um, that has every segment that has more than 100 synapses. And that's very similar to how the hemibrain um, proofreading operated, for instance, for basically everything um, above a certain size has been proofread. And this here is showing what is left to do for us. So there are about 48,000 segments, primarily in the optic lobe, um, optic lobes, both of them um, left uh, to, to proofread. 
In total, we expect it to be about 122,000 neurons. Um, that is based on the neuronal nucleus count by Shang Mu, um, which counted about 115,000 nuclei, neuronal nuclei in the brain. And then there are additionally probably 7,000 um, neurons that are both ascending and sensory neurons and for total count of approximately 20,000. If you add up those two numbers up here, you will get more than 100,000. And that is because the visual projection neurons, they show up in both. And that makes up for the difference. Those are, I think, about 7,000 neurons. Another way to look at, um, oh, yeah, one thing I want to find out here is that proofreaders in Princeton actually have done a tremendous amount of work figuring out the last pieces, the last segments um, that were left over and trying to proofread them. We found that there were about 500 segments left that they could not correct. They also cataloged those, and we found that only five of them amounted to what we would call a neuron. Um, all the other ones were segments that just couldn't be attached. So we think that we are actually not missing um, many or just five neurons overall out of the entire kind of 100,000. Okay, another way of looking at this is um, looking at completion as um, the fraction of synapses that can be that were attached to a segment that has been marked as proofread. That again is very similar to how the whole hemi brain um, counted completion. And here I'm breaking this up by central brain, optic lobe, and overall, and also by pre and postsynaptic. The first thing to note the central brain is about a 95% presynapse attachment rate. And that is as good as I think it gets. Um, after that, you end up with tiny segments that are contributing individual synapses each, um, not justifying the proofreading effort to attach those. However, on the postsynaptic side, that um, attachment fraction is, is much lower. And that is because the twigs where those synapses are made are usually much harder to segment. And there we are seeing attachment rates of about 35 to 40%. And again, that is also quite similar to the hemi brain, as you will see in a second. We can break this up um, by neuropil. And this is showing these attachment rates for each neuropil. And the one thing that I want you to take away from this is that on the presynaptic side, um, these are all quite similar. You see the entire central brain that has been now proofed. Um, but on the postsynaptic side, they vary quite a bit. And um, that might be because most synapses are on twigs versus backbones in some neuropils. Um, but regardless of why, um, that means that more or less synapses are actually included in the connectum um, that are actually there, and that might affect analyses um, to, a, um, to a certain amount. We can compare um, to, again, to the hemibrain, which I'm taking here basically as a gold standard, which when we take that as, um, as a gauge, um, as, a, um, yeah, as a check, basically, um, to see that uh, our um, post-synapse attachment rates are um, good. And here, every dot is a neuropil, and the attachment rate on the hemibrain is on the y-axis um, as a pull out of neuroprint, and on the x-axis is flywire right now. You see a good correlation, and there are some neuropils, especially um, in the upper here, which are in the um, mushroom bodies in the central complex where the hemibrain is better, and that is also because there has been a lot of care taken in the proofreading of the hemibrain because those were of particular interest. And we can also look at this on the presynaptic side. And then again, we, we have pretty much agreement here. These two outliers here, these are two optic lobe neuropils. And as proofing progresses, they will join the other ones in the upper right corner um, at about 95% attachment rates. So um, where does that leave us? Where, where are we and where will we be uh, soon? I think that um, taking presynaptic attachment rate is a good gauge of how far um, along the under proofreading, we have 38% attached um, overall. Um, by when we expect 95%, that gets us to 87% complete. And this is how um, this attachment rate has developed over the last month. If we extrapolate that um, and add a little curve here, which is to be expected once we hit high completion rates, that the proofreading of the small segments um, will become more tedious. Um, and so we will basically taper off. Um, so I expect that by the end of the year, early next year, uh, we will reach a point where basically every neuron um, has been um, completed to a, a large extent and is good for analysis. And there will be ongoing work um, that uh, cleans up around the edges and takes care of the remaining um, small fragments 
um, and that will be a process that will continue multiple months into 2023. However, it will most likely not affect uh, analyses um, that much anymore and only in very fringe edge cases. So then on a final note on reconstruction, I wanted to address quality. In the flyby paper, we have evaluated quality of proofreading and we found that the best way to evaluate quality of proofreading is to do more proofreading and to see if more proofreading further improves um, those segments and by how much. Um, we used volumetric and synapse-wise scores for that and found that back then one round of proofreading was pretty, got us to almost 100% of what we can achieve in three rounds. We um, did something similar where we chose random 726 segments out of the central brain once that was marked as basically complete. And uh, proofreaders in Princeton tried to meticulously um, proofread those further. And for some, they were able to attach for the segments, which is to be expected because we're not proofing, we're only proofing to those that have 100 synapses, but most of them are basically unchanged at all. So we think that the neurons in Flywire are of high quality and um, good for analysis. Then, because um, changing gears here a little bit, um, many of you asked in the RCP about synapses and neurotransmitters. So I wanted to address that um, very briefly. We make use of publicly available synapse predictions um, by the Funke lab. Um, that's for both the synapses and the neurotransmitters. And here on the left, I'm showing you those synapse links that we imported from the Boom et al. paper. And those are available, and they also come with scores, which is outlined in the documentation for those synapses, which can be used to threshold them um, for higher precision. Then for every one of these, um, we have a, a neurotransmitter classification um, in Action et al. Um, they they um, try to assign one of six different neurotransmitters, GABA, acetylcholine, glutamine, serotonin, octopamine, and dopamine. And every synapse has a probability distribution over those neurotransmitters. What we then do is um, for uh, to aggregate, which we'll see, for instance, in codex, is we take the average of all the outgoing synapse of a neuron, of the neurotransmitters, um, to get an overall neurotransmitter score. Those neurotransmitter scores have been found to be quite good, but there are cases where they are failing, um, for instance, for individual cell types um, that were not um, they were far away from the, what was included in the ground truth. So it is advised that if your analysis relies heavily on the new transmitters for a specific cell type um, to check um, those specifically to make sure that they are good. But in a, as a whole, those new transmitter predictions are um, very good for analysis. We also verified the counts of our synapses. Um, so here I'm showing the counts um, of synapse locations per neuropil in flyby and the hemibrain, and there is a good correlation between the two. And with that, I want to end on annotations. Um, a complete connectome needs cell annotations. We are getting close to um, finishing the reconstruction, but especially annotations are still required. Um, the community contributed annotations for about 30,000 cells. Um, those very um, quite a lot in terms of specificity and um, what they actually annotate. And these are available um, through the light bulb menu. So you can click on cell identification for a given neuron, and this will get you to this page, which um, shows you the annotation. On this page, um, you can also search for um, cell identifications in this drop down menu. You can select cell identification and type in something you want to look for. And um, it will come up if you have something that is similar. This information is also available in Codex. And you can also submit identification um, by clicking here for a given neuron on this button, and it will bring up a window where you can type in your identification. Um, for uh, the release, uh, what we are planning to do um, is to provide course subtype annotations. So I'm showing you here nine classes that we are planning um, to, um, to assign, one of each to assign to every neuron in the um, complete connectome. And this information is built on, um, on an annotation effort, both by the community and also what the um, Chelfers lab is doing. And you will hear more about this from Philip Schlegel in a second. Um, this information of, of course subtypes 
is already available in Cortex. It will soon be available through CAVE. And um, yeah, this is work in progress, so I expect changes um, for these annotations. Okay, with that, I want to acknowledge all the hard work from everybody involved to keep the site running. Um, I want to especially highlight also the folks over at the Allen Institute, with which we are um, collaborating on CAVE um, and working to keep the lights on in Flyby um, every day. And with that, I want to pass it on to Philip, who's a postdoc in the Chaffers Lab and um, has been working hard on annotating and matching to Hemibrain. Philip, are you there? Uh, I'm there. Um... Okay, great. So everyone, we'll take uh, questions at the end. We'll just uh, move through all these presentations one after another, and then uh, we'll we'll have time for Q and A. Thanks, Philip. Uh, thank you. Um, all right. Sorry, it's still loading. There you go. Um, you should be seeing the screen, right? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so Sven has already said as much, um, but if you've um, worked in Flywire for a little, um, then you're surely aware that um, essentially annotations are what make a connectome useful at the end of the day. Um, so you really need it to get the most out of it. Um, and we've been making a point of um, essentially collecting annotations uh, fairly early on. Um, so uh, for us, the sort of process of proofreading and um, annotation hasn't been sort of a, a sequential thing, but rather we've been you know, annotating as we, we've proofread. And um, that wasn't just a one-way process, but uh, it went two way, ways uh, in the sense that um, you know, if uh, the annotation brought up some discrepancy, say you find a cell type on the right, but you can't find the homolog neuron on the left, um, then you would go back and double check your neuron. That kind of uh, situation came out quite, quite frequently. Um, and as you can see, if you look at the little uh, footnotes there, we've been quite prolific um, on both ends. Um, and I'll spend a few slides sort of um, talking about our efforts. Um, now the public annotation system if I wire, um, uh, that you're familiar with is um, by design nimble, right? So anyone can add any annotation to any neuron, um, but for certain analyses, you wanna have one ground truth, one curated ground truth, right? So you wanna have say one cell class that's um, consistent across neurons of that cell class. You don't wanna have like 20 synonyms and uh, walk your way through those. Um, so what we've been doing internally is for every single flower neuron, in the central brain, um, or that has arbors in the central brain to be more uh, specific, uh, collect a bunch of data points. Um, those include, but are not limited to um, the side, so whether neuron is on the left, on the right, or um, in the center, the cell class, which is what uh, Sven showed you on his last slide. So that would be um, uh, uh, things like endocrine, or in this case, even more specific, this is antenna lobe local neuron, um, uh, the thing on the left here, actually do these two neurons. Um, then a cell type, if that's available. So in this case, uh, these neurons are or have been called keystone. Um, we're also collecting uh, the hemi lineage, which, which is the developmental unit of uh, of these neurons. Um, we collect. We're trying to find a hemibrain type. So in this case, uh, these neurons are called IL3, LN6 in the hemibrain. Um, then we collect a neurotransmitter. Um, and where available the virtual flybrain ID, which lets you cross-reference a neuron to um, the virtual flybrain database, which includes um, light level um, data and also uh, publications. So that's a nice way of sort of cross-linking and finding neurons um, outside of Flywire. And then we also track the SOMA position. Um, Okay, so just to sort of give you a brief idea of where we are, this is still, a lot of this is still an ongoing process. Um, so in terms of these super classes that Sven was talking about, um, we're currently tracking uh, almost 50,000 neurons in the central brain. Um, of those uh, 32,000, um, almost 33,000 are um, intrinsic. So they, all their arbors um, are in the central brain. Um, then there's modern neurons, about a hundred of them. Um, we're having about well, slightly over 5,000 sensory neurons, um, then a couple of thousand ascending and descending neurons that go to and from the ventral nerve cord, and uh, last but not least, about 8,000 visual projection neurons. So those are neurons that either project from the optic lobes into the brain or vice versa. Um, and these are fairly stable, I should say. Then for the side, um, what you see here is just for every single X, Y, Z coordinate, which is for the majority of these neurons, the SOMA position, um, except for the sensory neurons where it's the nerve uh, entry side. And, um, you know, green is the right-hand side, 
uh, orange is the left hand side and you can see if you just compare those two numbers they um, pretty much add up again this is sort of fairly stable and um, we'll make this available uh, in the near future um, then for the hemilineage um, so this is again sort of basically uh, the process of mapping um, these neurons based on the morphology and how the cell body fiber looks onto um, previously published um, uh, lineage data sets um, so there's a couple of um, publications you can see some in the lower right um, and uh, at the moment and this is an example of those this is the dm4 ventral lineage on the right and on the left the cell body is actually in this case in the back um, so we're currently sitting at about 50 percent um, of these central brain neurons with the lineage and another 50% um, without. So we're trying to get those numbers down and these numbers up. Um, although not all neurons will have a lineage in the end. Um, all right, uh, then, and I guess this might be most interesting for um, uh, at least some of you. Um, we've been making a big push to getting hemibrain matches. Um, and I should say that in this case, our matches are type matches. So we don't match individual neurons to individual neurons between flywire and the hemibrain, but we match flywire neurons to hemibrain types. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see an example. Let me just move, zoom out of the way. So this is AVLP205. Uh, which has two cells in the hemibrain. And then here you see the homologous neurons uh, on the left and the right inside of flywire. And in terms of where we are, uh, we have about 35% of these central brain neurons um, with a match that has been manually reviewed. Um, so those are high quality matches. Then we have uh, another about 40% where we have decent matches, but they haven't been looked at. Um, and then uh, the remainder is essentially either things that are not even in the heavy brain volume, so there will never be a match, or things where the matches are bad. This is all primarily based on NBLAST. Um, and these, uh, a large chunk of these will be things that um, essentially have like a couple of arbors sticking into the heavy brain volume. Um, so it will be hard to match them, um, presumably SEZ neurons or GNG. Um, okay, so I just thought I'd also. Um, add in something in terms of analysis, so the kinds of stuff you can do with uh, with uh, these data or these annotations. And one of the things that you can do if you have matches between um, these three hemispheres, so hemibrain, flower right, and flower left, you can pull out uh, neurons and then ask whether an edge between identified, cross-identified neurons uh, exists in all three hemispheres, right? So in this case, for example, you can ask, does this edge exist in, uh, in also in, on the right-hand side of flower wire or in the hemibrain? And um, here's just one example of uh, this analysis, um, which in this case asks for a given uh, edge in the hemibrain. And this is by the edge strength, which is the number of synapses. Um, what are the odds? What is the chance that um, you find this edge in neither left or right hemisphere of flywire in one, that's the green line, or in both? So in flywire left and flywire right. And you can see that, for example, if you take a uh, random five synapse uh, edge from the hemibrain, then there is um, about a 90% chance that you will find it at least in one flywire hemisphere and, uh, and about 60% chance that you'll find it in both. Um, and this is the kind of analysis um, stereotypy and um, robustness that we'll be looking into using these annotations. Um, so second to last slide, um, just briefly so that you have names to the individual efforts. So this annotation effort is obvious, obviously isn't all done by myself, but there's various uh, strands that different people are working on. And if you're interested in any particular one, you might want to get in touch with the respective uh, lead. So on the Hemi lineages, um, we have Iji and Alex who are principally involved on our end um, for ascending and descending neurons that be Kati and Paul. Um, Sensio neurons and hemibrain matching, uh, you might want to talk to me. Um, same for the if you have any sort of large scale and last questions, um, when it comes to neurotransmitters, there was actually a collaboration between our lab and uh, Jan Funke's lab, um, where on our end, uh, Alex Bates has been principally involved. So he might be uh, the person to talk to if you have any questions on the neurotransmitter side. Um, Sven has already alluded to the fact that there's some idiosyncrasies when it comes to predict predictions, um, and Alex might be help able to help you out there. And then um, uh, we've also worked on, and this sort of feeds into a lot of these projects on the between brain transforms. So taking a neuron from the hemibrain, say, and put it in the flywire space. Um, now, as I said earlier, um, the stable annotations, which currently are cell class, so the super class, the side and the summer position um, is something that Sven will make available 
um, to the community pretty soon. Um, if you're uh, keen to collaborate on any of the uh, work in progress annotations, say the hemibrain matches or the cell typing, then uh, please do get in touch with Greg. And uh, last but not least, um, I thought I'd you know at least briefly advertise again. We have two uh, libraries, one for Python and one for R. They're both called FFbSEC. And what they let you do is essentially interact with Flywire. You can fetch neuron meshes. Um, you can query annotations, get connectivity, skeletonize neurons, run in blasts um, uh, to your heart's content. Um, so this is sort of the low level um, uh, counterpart to, for example, the Codex platform. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that and just thank the Flywire community um, and then hand over to Amy, who is the crowdsourcing manager for Flywire and iWire. All right, well, hello everyone. Hi, uh, I'm Amy Sterling. I am the, like, like Philip said, I'm the crowdsourcing manager for Flywire and outreach coordinator, um, but I'm relatively new to the Flywire project. So I just wanted to do a quick little bit of background about what I was doing before. Um, so I spent the past decade or so working on iWire with Sebastian Sung. Um, iWire is one of the first citizen science games, uh, one of the first citizen science projects that utilized AI paired with human insight. Um, it's EM reconstructions from the retina of a mouse from the E2198 data sets. Um, it's produced some great science. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people from like 150 countries have joined over the years. Um, and it's a, a wonderful community of contributors who are helping uh, us to reconstruct neurons and have also kind of proved the concepts, some of the concepts of crowdsourcing that are hopefully going to be applicable to Flywire and future projects. Um, and on a personal note, I just I just love brains. I mean, I think neuroscience is so endlessly fascinating. It's wonderful. There's so much to see and explore when it comes to understanding how these amazing little complicated neurons create thinking, you know, behaving organisms. So it's my honor and my pleasure to get to work on this Flywire project um, and uh, to be sharing what we're working on with all of you today. So you are probably aware that there's some citizen scientists who have been contributing to Flywire. So I so there's a few hundred thousand people who have participated in iWire, but we did a closed alpha invite to some of the most elite iWirers into Flywire, um, and a very small subset of players, super players. Um, 16 players from iWire have had production access uh, to Flywire, and we only began inviting the citizen scientists in May of this year. Um, and these players are, are very experienced. They have, on average, seven and a half years experience doing EM construction per person. Um, and these 16 players have a combined 117 years of experience doing EM. So uh, they really know what they're doing and uh, I think are, are really behind the banner of mapping the brain to progress science. So just a snapshot of the, the contributions from the community so far. Um, even though they just started in May, they've already made 175,000 edits. Um, they have proofread around 13,000 neurons from the optic lobe, and they've added labels to about 1,100 cells as well. So um, an amazing effort, um, especially from such a small group. So I wanted to say a quick thank you to the citizen scientists. You may have seen some of their uh, usernames in Flywire chat, but um, they're around. And I wanted to share also a couple of the resources that they've made uh, for each other, because it may be interesting or potentially useful for you guys too. So first, uh, so prior to Codex, um, you know, the citizen scientists made this resource, which is this optic lobe cell guide. Um, so, you know, when you're proofreading neurons or annotating neurons, it can be helpful to know what to expect, where you should expect to see branches or not see branches. Um, so the, the citizen scientists combed through all the literature and created this amazing spreadsheet that has like over 200 different types of optic lobe neurons complete with snapshots of the neurons themselves, links to Flywire, 
notes about things to watch out for. Um, it's a large spreadsheet, so it can take a little while to load. Um, and there are some empty rows or some types of neurons that are mentioned in literature that are um, not yet in Flywire. Um, but we'll share a link to this in case it's helpful or inspiring uh, for any of you guys. And then there's also this little cell field for a lot of the neurons where you can, the, the players have collected um, gardens of neurons. So clusters of example uh, types of neurons from different classes from the optic lobe uh, in case this is helpful in identifying cells or uh, learning the, the morphology of those cells. There's also a set of plugins that Christoph Crook has made. So Christoph's been making add-ons for iWire for many years now, and he's recently turned his efforts to Flywire. So here's, we'll drop a link in chat to a summary of, of all the plugins that Christoph has made, but here's a couple that are, are really great. Um, this, this links plugin, uh, it's a link that fits in the links on the left-hand menu in Flywire, and you can just save any links to any groups of cells that you want in Flywire, which can be really handy. Um, and then there's this also this local uh, seg ID uh, editor where you can rename the, the long string of numbers for seg IDs into whatever you'd like. Uh, and there's also a dark UI mode, which is, which is kind of handy and convenient in Flywire. So check those out if that's of interest. Um, I also wanted to mention a, an interesting sort of collaboration that's come about. So, uh, you know, tracing in EM is, is actually, you can migrate between species, it's, it's roughly the same, you know, finding the edges, finding the 3D structure of cells, but understanding the morphology is sort of a critical component to accurate reconstruction. So um, we have a whole forum set up for the players that's separate from Slack. And there've been a lot of questions about the structure and morphology and typing of these cells. Um, and Emil Kind has been really helpful in answering lots of questions for the players. He did a whole symposium for them, guiding them through the optic lobe. Um, and a little collaboration came out of it. Um, we realized that uh, this player, Stoxy, I don't know if you're here, Stoxy, but hey, uh, um, <laughs> this player was uh, interested in these really cool DM4 cells. And Emil was also working on these. So Emil shared a strategy of how he goes about finding the, the DM4s in order to proofread them. And then Stocky deployed that strategy to help uh, find and proofread lots of these cells in the optic lobes. So if there's neurons that you're interested in, I guess we're reaching the end of proofreading, but if there's groups of neurons that you are trying to, you know, more rapidly do group identification or labeling for, uh, reach out to me and maybe we can put more collaborations together with the citizen scientists. Um, and lastly, I want to mention that we're going to do a couple of Flywire workshops coming up. So these are uh, going to be short workshops that will show new features from the Connectome Data Explorer, which Ari is going to talk about here in a minute. We're adding new features to that like almost every day. So it's it's constantly evolving platform based on the feedback and suggestions from the community. Uh, at these workshops, we'll also show some pro tips for using Flywire and answer questions. So. Um, RSVP, RSVP via the link and let us know what you'd like to see covered or any questions that you have about Flywire or Codex. Uh, and we'll we'll try to curate the workshops to reflect what the community would like to see. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to my friend and colleague Ari, who's going to talk about all the really cool tools that he's building for analyzing and exploring and annotating the networks of these amazing and beautiful cells from the fly brain. So thanks so much. Take it away, Ari. All right. Thank you, Amy. OK, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ari. My background is in uh, computer science and uh, software engineering. I joined the uh, Mahler's lab at Princeton about two years ago. And uh, recently, I assumed the role of uh, data evangelist for uh, Flywire. And I want to talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> uh, our kind of charter uh, for data dissemination uh, has three main pillars. Uh, one is uh, organizing the data. Uh, once, uh, once it's published, we want to have a, um, a good documentation of the schema formats for all the different resources, uh, like the segmentation, the 3D volumes, uh, annotations, all the metadata about the connection tables and synapses. We'd like to streamline uh, naming of cells. Uh, we want to have uh, canonical names assigned to all the cells that are stable across uh, uh, different versions of uh, the data as the uh, proofreading proceeds. Uh, and uh, 
also uh, uh, together with the data we want to publish uh, convenience uh, libraries uh, and uh, guides that will help ev everyone to consume the data and uh, analyze it. <clears throat> On the second pillar, we have um, uh, tools under development that are uh, focused for this transition of uh, phase from proofreading to analysis. Uh, and to this, uh, to this end, we uh, focus on exploration of the connectome uh, as well as annotation outside of the proofreading community. Um, we'll talk uh, a bit more about these tools in the next slides. Um, then the third uh, pillar is organizing all the flywire data in one place. Um, we are working on the new uh, public web page that will contain uh, the information about the project, uh, the science behind it, uh, papers, uh, guidelines for citations, credits, and so on. Uh, under this same uh, web page, we will also have a hub for all the resources that are available to, um, uh, to analyze the data. Uh, this will include all our internal tools that you are familiar with, uh, like uh, the Cave Client, all the Neuroglancer uh, apps and plugins. Um, and it will also include the popular uh, tools uh, that are built by other labs. Uh, like uh, FAFBSEC that uh, Philip mentioned, uh, we hope to have a new print interface for Flyware data as well. Um, uh, the brain circuits and and, uh, and and many other tools, uh, we, we would like to organize all of them in the in one place. And lastly, one additional uh, feature we want to have under this new Flywire uh, webpage is uh, some sort of marketplace where we will allow anyone who is developing tools. Uh, to uh, list their tool with a simple submission uh, process. And uh, with that, we hope to provide value both for the, uh, for the community of science, scientists, but also for the authors of these tools by increasing usage and uh, visibility. So quickly mention the, the status of the, the, this, uh, the various projects. Uh, we did release Codex. This is one of the tools for uh, we're building for exploration of the data. Uh, it is in uh, it, in beta testing by the community. Um, uh, we'll have a short uh, video demo uh, on the next slide for this tool. Uh, then the Flywire uh, homepage and uh, the hub for all the tools and resources is under development. Uh, we hope to have it. Uh, up uh, maybe end of November. And on the data organization, uh, the data catalog, uh, uh, versioning process, and so on, uh, uh, still under kind of requirement gathering and design, as well as uh, the annotation tools that we, we are um, also designing some easy process for anyone to annotate the data, uh, not just the proofreaders. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll think about how to use the existing uh, tools like NBLAST or other metrics we have uh, to compare cells to speed up the annotation process and make it easy. All right, so this, uh, this slide here, I'm going to play a, a little video that Amy made for demo of Codex. Hey, hey, here's a quick demo of the brand new Flywire Connectome Data Explorer, aka Codex. It is an easy to use tool that lets you explore the reconstructions and connections and annotations from Flywire. So to just get started, we'll do a little demo here with an LPSP neuron. It is really one of my favorite neurons. It's this really cool fan-shaped cell of the central brain. Um, so once you type in the cell of interest into the search bar, you get this little snapshot window. So so there's an interactive 3D viewer. Um, there's some information about the cells, which we'll get to in a sec. There's visual uh, overview of primary input, output, uh, hemispheres, neurotransmitters, neural pills. There's also this interactive network graph of individual cells. So you can see all of the primary input, output, neural pill, as well as the number of connections. And you can use this graph to jump to any of the, the neurons from uh, both input and output. It'll load the, the preview page for those individual cells. 
So if I go back to here, back to this uh, LPSP neuron, you can also in related under this related cell section, you can see all of the upstream neurons uh, that have more than five connections and all the downstream neurons. So I'll just load both of those up. Uh, in this page, you can sort of see the search results overview as well as download these results as a CSV, download the cell IDs, or view the cell matches in Flywire. Now I'll do this for upstream and downstream so we can check these out as they load after they load in the background. Um, it's loading static data so it's faster than regular Flywire. Um, you can also see similar cells, uh, cells with similar neuropill projection and also similar neuropill projection in opposite hemispheres. Codex also has this explore page where you can kind of get a snapshot of the whole data set. So there's different classes of cells uh, that you'll see here. We will be breaking sensory down into uh, the different senses. Uh, there's also some curated collections of groups of neurons in here. Uh, there are annotations from the community, lots of annotations from the community, but here's a snapshot of some of the most common ones, uh, as well as max in out neuropill groups. So you can you, you can check out the FAQ for how to format your search uh, to look within here so you can, you know, try to find, you know, specify your input and output neuropill to find, uh, you know, individual neurons or groups of neurons of interest. Uh, Flywire is in uh, Flywire Codex is in a closed alpha, which means that only people with production access to Flywire can access it. Uh, the next thing we're going to be adding is a credit system for annotations and, and proofreading credits. Um, but it's actively under development. This is really early phase. It's not going to be public until sometime in 2023. And we're sharing it early with the community because we would love to know what you would like to see. You know, what features do you want to see modified? expanded, changed, what would you like to be able to do with this that you can't currently do? Um, you know, that's that's kind of where we are and we'll be listening and want to make a conversation of, you know, how to make this tool so that even people who don't code, you know, have a way that they can explore and make sense of, of this data. So lastly, we'll just pop over to the um, up and downstream partners. So upstream partners of that LPSB neuron, you can see the the protocerebral bridge over there. And then downstream partners, you've got our little forbidden donut, the EPG ring right here. So hopefully with this tool, it will be really easy to find partners and pathways through the brain. Um, hope you enjoy it. Let us know what you think. Let us know how we can expand it and improve it. Uh, and thank you so much for all the work that you have put into Flywire. Um, it's been a labor of love by so many people. And hopefully this is just the beginning of this new era of Connectomics, uh, all thanks to the collaboration of a global community of researchers. So thank you so much and see you online. Okay, so thanks to Emmy for this uh, great video. Um, I just uh, want to mention again, if you haven't used it uh, yet, please do sign up uh, and join our workshops in the next couple of weeks. I'd like to conclude with my own thank yous for all the creators of the Flower uh, Connectome resource, community of scientists, proofreaders, tracers, everyone who participated in the process. Uh, also people I work with uh, daily on uh, these uh, data projects that I mentioned, Amy, Sven, uh, and Kai, Son, and Ryan, our developers who joined recently, uh, also on the analysis side and providing all the neuroscience and biology context and answering uh, my questions, Albert, Tony, Philip, and Dudi, and uh, Mala and Sebastian for all the guidance and uh, support. And with that, I think next is Mala to tell us what's next. Great. Thanks, Ari. Um... So, yeah, I um, wanted to just say a little bit about timeline and publication strategy, um, since we had promised uh, that we would address that in our in our next town hall. Um, could you go to the next slide, Ari? Okay, so um, here is uh, the plan right now. And uh, again, we're always welcome to feedback. Um, we're setting a deadline of November 27th for abstract submission from the community. So if you have a project you're working on that leverages Flywire data and you would like to join um, a paper package submission with us, so that is a submission to a journal uh, that will include the Flywire consortium paper uh, and other papers, 
um, uh, you know, in addition, uh, Greg's paper that Philip talked about on the annotations, etc. If you would like to join that uh, package submission, send us the abstracts. We will um, shop those abstracts around uh, and, um, uh, you know, uh, find a home for them so that uh, as you're working on the paper, uh, you know, you can format it accordingly, etc. So that's that's the deadline for for joining our, our package submission. In early December, we're planning to post a preprint, uh, a draft of the Flywire Consortium paper in the Slack forum, and we would like everyone's feedback. Um, and our intention is to submit in mid-December the consortium preprint to BioArchive. Now, this is going to be an early draft because, as Sven mentioned, uh, the connectome won't be completed in terms of proofreading until uh, most likely February. Um, so this will be an early version, uh, but the idea is that we want to communicate, you know, with, uh, you know, with the larger Drosophila community um, and, you know, anyone interested that uh, where we're at and uh, with this resource uh, and put that information out there. Um, and uh, in February, um, the plan is to submit uh, the paper and um, with these paper package submissions, uh, the once the journal has agreed to review the, the package, all papers may not need to go in at the same time. So if you're not ready with your paper by February, I think uh, that would be fine. But uh, we just wanted to be clear on our intention. Of course, these dates might move, uh, that our intention is to submit the paper in February. Um, I also just wanted to point out uh, that Flywire is, uh, is closed in a sense in that you have to join Flywire to access, you know, Codex and the data, and uh, uh, the way to join is to agree to our principles. So anyone is welcome to join. Uh, it just involves adherence to the principles and following of our authorship uh, guidelines, um, and that involves giving credit to those who proofread and annotate neurons that uh, appear in your publication. And so that still stands. Uh, that is the way the data is released now. Um, in February, though, our intention uh, when we submit this paper is to make the data at that point uh, open. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a consortium paper. That means, uh, you know, we are, you know, hugely in debt to the community of scientists uh, and now citizen scientists that are working with us to complete this, you know, major milestone for the field, having the first whole brain connectome. And uh, as such, there will be a consortium author list. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we intend to include, uh, you know, uh, everyone from the community who contributed significantly. So our view on significant contribution is roughly one week of work, either annotations or proofreading to be included on the author list. And what we're asking of you is that if you feel you have met this criteria, you send a message to flywire at princeton.edu, or you direct message Amy uh, on Slack, and you let us know that you'd like to be included in the author list. Um, from there, we'll, we'll take that list and um, we'll be back in touch with you. Okay, that's that. Uh, is there a next slide? All right. Um, the last point I wanted to make is that, um, uh, Ari didn't mention this, but in Codex, Every neuron in Flywire has uh, an automated name, and that's to facilitate science so that there is a way to refer to every neuron in Flywire. But this isn't the same as the annotations uh, that, uh, for example, Philip discussed uh, that involve matches with the hemibrain or names from the literature. And so we do really need those annotations uh, to, to complete this resource. Um, Philip and his colleagues have done a, an incredible job of, of matching up neurons with the hemibrain. It's a work in progress. Um, from the community, um, which includes uh, the work of the Jeffers Lab, we have collected, I think at this point, 55,000 annotations for, as Sven said, uh, about 30,000 neurons. Uh, we still have a ways to go. And in particular, um, we're sort of, uh, you know, still work in progress annotations outside of the hemibrain. Um, Amy talked about the effort of the flyers and the optic lobe, but all of you can help. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we hope 
that you will uh, come on board or if you're already a member of Flywire, you'll sort of step up your contributions in, in assisting with finishing the annotations. And so um, Sven highlighted how these can be submitted uh, through Flywire. We hope that you'll contribute more annotations in these remaining weeks um, as we gear up to, to complete the connectome. Um, you can also search in codecs for neurons that lack annotations uh, in order to find those we're missing and then uh, identify their names. Um, I think those are the main points I wanted to make. Hopefully the last slide is a thank you. Yes, it is. So um, I wanted to say thank you again to everyone who's here. Um, it's, uh, like I said, a major milestone that we're heading towards. We're not there yet. Uh, we still need your uh, work and participation. Um, but I'm, I'm really proud of the work everybody here has done together. And um, yeah, I want to thank you for being here today. So at this point, we're happy to open up to questions or discussion, um, if there are any questions, that is. Uh, Lou, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> The first question is about the neurotransmitter. Do all those always sum to one? Or if it's some unknown neurotransmitter, do you get all a bunch of zeros in those fields? Um, I'll, I'm happy to let Greg field that question <laughs> if you'd like, Greg. Yeah, they sum to one at present, too. OK, so if it's an unknown neurotransmitter, you're going to get some sort of a mix of existing transmitters. You'll, yeah, it'll look a bit flat. Okay. All right, thanks very much. Um, Lou, I wanted to point out that in Codex, uh, Ari has included the probability score from the neurotransmitter uh, predictions. So yeah. you'll you'll know, um, you know, if a neuron's assigned as glutamatergic, you'll know how yeah. likely that assignment was. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? I'll ask another one if no one else is asking. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So you, you can yeah. uh, get people uh, give yeah. people time to is, comment. Is there any thought of extracting uh, mitochondria or other internal cell structures in addition to the one what you've already got? Uh, we are not involved in that effort uh, to identify organelles within the data set, but it would be wonderful uh, if other people are. Is there anybody here who would like to say anything about that? Uh, you know, we, uh, a graduate student who works in Sebastian's lab uh, did nuclear detection to count the number of neurons in the data set. We have a bioarchive paper on that. Um, okay, thank you. But yeah. I had a quick question if. Sure, okay. Gabrielle, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if there's going to be any effort to allow um, searching of flywire neurons on NeuronBridge to get matches with the light level data, or maybe that will come when um, the data joins NewPrint. Yeah, that's a good point. So we um, actually, Sven, why don't you go ahead and take this question? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good point, and we would love to make that available. There is actually already a way to do it, and that is Stefan Gerhardt's tool, Brain Circuit IO, um, has implemented a connection to NeuronBridge. And um, I believe he'll post, a, he has posted about this in the channel, channel in Slack, and will post, I think, again uh, very soon. So that is already one way to do it. Um, but yes, we would like to incorporate also another way in Flatwire directly, maybe others through Codex, um, to link to that resource. Uh, yeah, Davi, you have your hand up. Yeah, in classic uh, fashion, this is a comment, not a question, but less classic because it's a complimentary comment. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say <laughs> I, I really am gratified by this community's work in this data set on all levels. Um, you know, a large team of people worked together to produce the data set and we thought it would be impactful and i think you guys are really collectively delivering on that promise um so i just wanted to say this is really great 
and thanks. Thanks for generating the data, Davi. Well, a lot of people to thank there, but yeah. Um, Mala, there's a question from the chat from our citizen scientist asking how will citizen scientists be credited in the scientific paper uh, produced by name, by handle, or just as a group of citizen scientists? Um, I think uh, we'll, we'll post updates in the forum on uh, authorship plans as they develop uh, and, and the list, but the plan now is to have a consortium uh, list of authors um, and everyone will be included in that list, whether they're a scientist or a citizen scientist. Um, so, um, you know, it'll include the full list of authors uh, that have worked in the data set. Again, either at least a week of proofreading or annotation work. Can I make a comment on that? Um, we did a paper with a zillion authors and some points like this come up. One is that uh, some journals like eLife require that each author submit, they send an email to them and they have to say that they're okay with the paper. And so you need sort of a real name or a real email address in order to get those things through. Um, also, I like to see ORCID IDs and things like that. And so I don't know, you know, I don't think that's mandatory though. But that's something if you're a citizen scientist, you might consider getting yourself an ORCID ID to make it easier for other people to find you in the future. Thanks, Lou. Sebastian, did you want to add anything about the um, paper package submission? Well, I did I did want to make a comment about annotation. So um, what was discussed was better means of people to contribute annotations. Um, I think another way that people can contribute is by um, sort of helping us list the known unknowns. So if you know of a class of neurons that needs that sh that could be annotated, but we don't have it yet. You know, you should let us know. Uh, we need to make a list of what what can be done, but still hasn't been done. I mean, do any, does anybody know of such classes already? Yeah. So you know, if you if you look for your favorite neurons and don't find them, then you should definitely let us know. <laughs> Yeah, that's the easiest way is run a search in Codex. And if, if nothing comes up, we, we lack those annotations. And I just want to also echo what Amy said about, you know, contacting us. Don't be shy. Please don't be shy. Um, you know, obviously, we want to hear from everybody um, about things that could be improved, kinds of information that are missing, and so on and so forth. And so, Amy, how should they contact you? Flywire at Princeton.edu? Yeah, that's Slack. That reaches me, you can Slack me or my my email is Amy Sterling at Princeton.edu. Yeah, so please don't hesitate. I mean, anything, even if it seems minor, or just there's no, since this whole resource is for you, um, don't be shy about contacting us. Yeah, a lot of people are sending me messages on Slack, so add to it. It's good. Uh, and we would like to highlight your work, you know, um, either on Twitter, um, uh, Amy posted a note that if you're going to SFN and you have a poster that leverages flywire data, we'd like to advertise it. So, um, you know, we're happy to help with promoting your work that uses flywire data. Great. Well, I think we're at an hour. So unless there is uh, someone else who'd like to jump in, um, I think we should end it there. Thank you all for coming. And uh, again, a great way to end it. We welcome your feedback. So please get in touch with us. Okay. Not any